Mr. Speaker, this is a historic day in the history of the people of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is historic because we as a people are showing that we have confidence in ourselves, that we have confidence in our jurisprudence, and we have confidence in the people of the region, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm proud and happy to be working with the men and women of the cabinet, the parliament, Mr. Speaker. And I'm, I want to thank the members of the session committee for the work they've done so far. And I'm sure that this work is going to continue, Mr. Speaker. But also I want to pay special mention to the former prime minister, the Honorable Dr. Kenny Anthony, who began this journey into what is going to happen today, Mr. Speaker. This journey into manhood, this journey into confidence and this journey into causing ourselves to be masters of our own destiny, Mr. Speaker. I want to, I want to thank Dr. Anthony for starting this process, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the bill for consideration is the Constitution of St. Lucia Amendment Bill. Mr. Speaker, the purpose of the bill is to amend the Constitution of St. Lucia Cap 1.0 on the Act to modify provisions that allow for appeals to a Majesty in Council and so, and so provide for appeals to the Caribbean Court of Justice. Clause 1 of the bill contains a short title of the bill and Clause 2 of the bill provides for the interpretation of the bill. Section 16.4 of the Act, Enforcement of Protective Provisions, is amended in Clause 3 of the bill so that where a question is referred to the High Court in pursuance of subsection 3 of that section, the High Court shall give its decision on the question and the court in which the question arose shall dispose of the case in accordance with the decision or if the decision is the subject of an appeal to the Court of Appeal or, the Caribbean, or to the Caribbean Court of Justice rather than Her Majesty in Council in accordance with the decision of the Court of Appeal or the Caribbean Court of Justice rather than to Her Majesty in Council. By virtue of Clause 4 of the Bill, Section 18.1 of the Act, Interpretation and Savings, is amended to remove the references to Her Majesty in Council and to substitute the Caribbean Court of Justice in the definition of the word court. In Clause 5 of the Bill, Section 41.7 of the Act, Alteration of the Constitution and Supreme Court order is amended in paragraph A by changing section 107 to section 108 <clears throat> and referring to the Caribbean Court of Justice rather than Her Majesty in Council. This means that a referendum will not be required to alter the provisions relating to appeals to the Caribbean Court of Justice. Clause 6 of the bill amend section 73.5 of the Act, Control of Public Prosecutions, so that for the purpose of that section, an appeal from a judgment in criminal proceedings before a court or case stated or question of law reserved for the purpose of these proceedings to another court, including the Caribbean Court of Justice, rather than Her Majesty in Council, is deemed to be part of the proceedings. Under Clause 7 of the Bill, Section 106.2 of the Act, reference of constitutional questions to High Court is amended so that where a question is referred to the High Court in pursuance of the section, the High Court will give its decision on the question and the court in which the question arose will dispose of the case in accordance with the decision. Or if the decision is subject to an appeal to the Court of Appeal, or Caribbean Court of Justice rather than a majesty in council in accordance with the decision of the Court of Appeal or, as the case may be, the Caribbean Court of Justice rather than her majesty in council. Section 108 of the Act 
appeals to a majesty in council is, substitu is substituted in clause 8 of the bill to make an appeal from a decision of the Court of Appeal possible to the Caribbean Court of Justice rather than Her Majesty in Council. A new section, 108A of the Act, Abolition of Appeals to Her Majesty in Council, is inserted under Clause 9 of the Bill to abolish appeals to Her Majesty in Council. <coughs> Clause 10 of the Bill <coughs> amends Section 1241 of the Act, Interpretation, to include definitions for the words Caribbean Court of Justice and Agreement and to include in definition of court the Caribbean Court of Justice. Mr. Speaker, these amendments to the Constitution of St. Lucia would mean that all appeals to any matter taken up in the lower court in St. Lucia, the final appeal will be to the Caribbean Court of Justice, Mr. Speaker instead of the Privy Council. This is a sum total of what we are doing today, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, the journey, this journey towards the point we are here today was continued in 2014 when the matter of a re referendum was cleared by the Court of Appeal, Mr. Speaker, saying that there was no referendum needed if St. Lucia had to move from the Privy Council to the Court of Appeal. That was cleared by the Supreme Court of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, Mr. Speaker. It was cleared, the Court of Appeal. That was clear. So that means that there was concurrence that we did not need a referendum to make the transition from the Privy, from the Privy Council to the, to the Caribbean Court of Justice, Mr. Speaker. That was clear from 2014. There is no legal basis for a referendum. And that was clear. And it's very important, Mr. Speaker, that we repeat that. We repeat it, Mr. Speaker. However, the need for a referendum was cleared by the Eastern Caribbean Court of Appeal. So, Mr. Speaker, the Labour Party in its manifesto in the last general election of 2021, on page 28 of the manifesto, Mr. Speaker, and I quote, here is what the manifesto said. It said, we will commence the process for the ascension to the Caribbean Court of Justice as St. Lucia's final appellant court as the replacement to the Privy Council. That was clearly stated in the manifesto of the St. Lucia Labour Party in the 2021 general election, Mr. Speaker. And on the 26th of July 2021, the people voted for the Labour Party with a resounding victory of 13 seats to 2, Mr. Speaker, and we were joined by two other members, giving us a majority of 15 seats to 2. That was clear. That was clear, Mr. Speaker, in the manifesto, Mr. Speaker. On the 29th of March, 2022, Mr. Speaker, the Governor General, in his throne speech, announced that the government intended to terminate its relationship with the Privy Council. He said it in clear and, on, and certain terms, Mr. Speaker, on the 29th of March, in his budget address, Mr. Speaker, in his throne speech. It was clear. And the throne speech is normally the policy of the government, Mr. Speaker. In my budget address on the 26th of April 2022, I stated clearly on page 50, I announced that a committee chaired by an ex-judge had been tasked to assist in the process of ascension to the Caribbean Court of Justice through public education, etc. That was stated clearly in my budget address on the 26th of April 2022, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, continuing the process, on the 30th of March 2022, a letter was written to the Foreign Secretary requesting agreement to amend the Constitution to terminate jurisdiction of the Privy Council. 
That letter was written to the foreign secretary, the British foreign secretary, Mr. Speaker, to, to inform her and to ask permission, if you want to say, to, um, to let us leave the Privy Council. She res the foreign secretary responded, Mr. Speaker, on the 10th of August, 2022. And for the purposes of the record, Mr. Speaker, and for certainty and clarity, <coughs> I will read the letter that came from the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office, Mr. Speaker. The letter reads, Dear Prime Minister, thank you for your letter of 30th March addressed to the Foreign Secretary requesting agreement to amend specified sections of the Constitution of St. Lucia that will have the effect of terminating the jurisdiction of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, JCPC, in relation to appeals from any court having jurisdiction in St. Lucia and to accede to the jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice. I apologize for the delayed response. The Foreign Secretary has asked me to reply. The British government has always taken the view that it is a matter for the government and people of the country concerned. In the case of St. Lucia, to decide whether or not to avail themselves of the jurisdiction of the JCPC. I can therefore confirm that this is a matter for you to progress via legal and political channels and you should write to me again for ministerial sign off when the preparatory work has been completed. Yours sincerely, Vicky Ford, Minister for Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. This is the letter that came from the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office, Mr. Speaker, to in responding to my letter on the 40th of March, informing them that we intended to cease our association with the Privy Council, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a draft bill was laid before this Honorable House on the 11th of October 2022 for the first reading, Mr. Speaker, of, of that amendment to the Constitution, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that is keeping in the provision of the Constitution, Section 416A of the Constitution that stipulates that there must be a delay of 90 days before the first and second reading of any bill that will amend the Constitution of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. There must be a delay, there must be a time span of 90 days between the first reading and the second and subsequent readings. And if you check, Mr. Speaker, you'll see it's in excess of 90 days between the 11th of October and today, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, it, it is clear that all the constitutional requirements have been met for us to amend the Constitution, Mr. Speaker. All the constitutional requirements, all what is required by the Constitution. No need for a, a referendum, putting the bill for the first reading, and 90 days between the first reading and the subsequent second and third readings. That has been done, and that is clear, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let's be, let us talk a little bit about the structure of the Caribbean Court of Justice, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it has two distinct jurisdictions. One of them is interpreting and applying the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, which determines how the CSME works, and St. Lucia and other CARICOM states of CARICOM have already acceded to the jurisdiction of the court in the CSME. So St. Lucia is already a part of the Caribbean Court of Justice as it relates to interpretation of the revised Treaty of Chagaramas. St. Lucia is already part of that setup, Mr. Speaker. The original jurisdiction, Mr. Speaker, of the Caribbean Court of Justice, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Caribbean Court of Justice as a replacement 
to the Privy Council is already incorporated into the laws of St. Lucia. But I will allow the lawyers to expand more on, on that notion, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you hear the complaints or the accusations that the court will not be independent. Mr. Speaker, hey, listen to how the Caribbean Court of Justice is financed, Mr. Speaker. It's financed from the proceeds of a trust fund of, I think, 100 million US dollars, to which St. Lucia has already invested 2.1 million dollars, Mr. Speaker. That means, Mr. Speaker, that no government can, no government can say, I am not paying today because you did not rule in my, in my favor, Mr. Speaker. That $100 million has been put in a trust fund, and that trust fund is managed by trustees, and they say how to invest the money, how to invest the funds, so you can get a return so the court can meet its obligations to pay salary the settlement. So no prime minister can say he's withdrawing, he is withdrawing his contribution for the court because they are annoyed, Mr. Speaker. So that means there is no political pressure as far as funding of the court is concerned, Mr. Speaker. The other point of contention, Mr. Speaker, that they want to bring is they say that the judges will not be independent and because judges are chosen by politicians, Mr. Speaker. Again, very wrong, Mr. Speaker. And please allow me to tell you how the judges are selected in the court, Mr. Speaker. The judges are selected by Regional Judicial and Legal Services Commission that is independent from political control or influence. The president of the court is the chairman. And Mr. Speaker, let me read for you the composition of the Regional Judicial and Legal Services Commission. <clears throat> On page four, Mr. Speaker, of the agreement that sets up that set up the Caribbean Court of Justice, Mr. Speaker, it is clear who is in the Regional Judicial and Legal Services Commission. And let me quote Mr. Speaker from that agreement. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the Regional and Judicial Service Commission <clears throat> is made up of the following persons. The President, who shall be Chairman of the Commission. Two persons nominated jointly by the Organization of the Commonwealth Caribbean Bar Association and the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, the Bar Association. Mr. Speaker, it is not my, it is not my habit of calling names in this honorable house. I always refrain from calling names of private citizens in the honorable house, Mr. Speaker. But when, Mr. Speaker, in a serious matter like that, you have people's names are bandied around for political purposes, Mr. Speaker, it is unfair, and I'll ask you leave to mention a name, Mr. Speaker. The name of Thaddeus Antoine has been bandied around, even to imply that Thaddeus Antoine is an operative of the St. Lucia Labour Party, and he'll be able to influence the appointment of judges. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, Thaddeus Antoine was not appointed by the Labour Party. Thaddeus Antoine is there because of his position on the organization of Eastern Caribbean States Bar Association. By his office, Mr. Speaker. The Labour Party has absolutely no say in appointing anybody in that, in that situation. Mr. Speaker, again, I don't want to mention names, but it's very important Mr. that I mention names today. Because, Mr. Speaker, people just say these things. They put it on social media. They damage people's reputation. They call people all kinds of names, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you, the names of St. Lucians who have served on this commission, Mr. Speaker. The Right Honorable Deceased, Sir Vincent Flossack, was the appointee an appoint me, uh, appointment of, of the Labour Party. Mr. Egbert Lanel, 
Was he an appointee of the Labour Party? Mr. Everistus Jamari, Mr. Tyrone Chung, and surprise, surprise, Mr. Frank Myers. <laughs> I guess he was appointed. He was appointed Labour Party too. These, Mr. Speaker, these are the people who have solutions have been on the, the regional judicial and services commission, Mr. Speaker. But they continue the lies and they continue the defamation of people's characters. Mr. Speaker, the food, the chairman of the Judicial Service Commission of a contracted party selected in rotation in English alphabetical order for a period of three years. You see how much caution, precaution is taken, Mr. Speaker? Let me tell you, let me read for you again. One chairman of the Judicial Services Commission of a contracting party selected in rotation in the English alphabetical order for a period of three years. D. The chairman of a public service commission of a contracting party selected in rotation in the reverse English alphabetical order for a period of three years. Alphabetical order for a period of three years in reverse. The other one was in rotation, not in reverse. Two persons from civil society, two persons from civil society, nominated jointly by the Secretary General of the Committee and the Director General of the OECS for a period of three years following consultations with regional non-governmental associations. NGOs, Mr. Speaker. The other members are two distinguished jurists nominated jointly by the Dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of the West Indies, the deans of the faculties of law of any other contracting parties, and the chairman of the Council of Legal Education. And Mr. Speaker, allow me to break, Mr. Speaker, to publicly put on record my congratulations to Professor Rosemary Antoine, who is now the, the principal of the St. Augustine campus, Mr. Speaker. And I know a member inside the head knows her very well. <laughs> Two. <laughs> the other members, Mr. Speaker, of the Judicial and Legal Commission, Mr. Speaker. Two persons nominated jointly by the bar or law associations of the contracting party. Mr. Speaker, that these are the people who choose the judges. These are the people, Mr. Speaker. These are the ones who, 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 who choose the judges, Mr. Speaker. And they bring it far back to the Labour Party. Mr. Speaker, further. The judges of the court, other than the president, shall be appointed or removed by a majority vote of all the members of the commission. A majority vote of all the members of the commission, Mr. Speaker. And that is stipulated in page three of the agreement, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the president is appointed or removed by the qualified majority, Mr. Speaker. The president shall, shall be appointed or removed by the qualified majority of three quarters of the contracting parties on the recommendation of a commission of inquiry or tribunal. Three quarter, the president shall be ap appointed or removed by the qualified majority of three quarters of the contracting parties. The judges of the court, other than the president, shall be appointed or removed by majority vote of all the members of the commission, Mr. Speaker. This is how judges are chosen, and this is how judges are dismissed, Mr. Speaker. Further. On page 8, Mr. Speaker, listen to how judges 
can be removed also a judge may be removed from office only by only for inability to perform the functions of his office whether arising from illness or any other cause of a misbehavior and shall not be so removed except in accordance with the provisions of this article mr speaker subject to article 4 paragraph 5 the president shall be removed from office by the heads of government on the recommendation of the commission if the question of removal of the president has been referred to by the heads of government to a tribunal and the tribunal has advised the commission that the president ought to move from office for inability to be to for inability or misbehavior mr speaker in paragraph four a tribunal force that is the system mr speaker if at least three heads of government in the case of the president jointly represent to the other heads of government or if the commission decides in the case of the any other judge that the question of removing the president or the judge of office ought to be investigated then the heads of government or the commission shall appoint a tribunal which shall consist of a chairman and not less than two other members selected by the heads of government or the commission as the case may be after such consultations as may be considered expedient from among persons who hold or have held office as a judge of a court of unlimited jurisdiction in civil and criminal matters in some part of the Commonwealth, Mr. Speaker, or in a state exercising civil law jurisprudence common to contracting parties or a court having jurisdiction in appeals from any such courts. And the tribunal shall inquire into the matter and advise the heads of government or the commission, as the case may be, whether or not the president or judge ought to be removed from office, Mr. Speaker. These are the conditions, Mr. Speaker, in an agreement, and that agreement was signed, Mr. Speaker, from, it was signed, Mr. Speaker, by the heads of government, Lester Bood, 14 February 2001, <coughs> Owen Arthur, February, February 2001, Said Musa, February 2001, Keith Mitchell, February 2001, Clement Rohi for the government of Guyana, February 2001, Percival J. Patterson for the government of Jamaica, 14 of February 2001, Denzel Douglas for the government of Southern Kitts, 14 February 2001, Kennedy Anthony for the government of St. Lucia, 14 February 2001, and Ralph Gonzalez for the government of St. Vincent, 15 of February 2003, and the government of, Re of the Republic of Venice of Suriname, 14 February 2001, and Basilio Pandey for the government of Sri and Tobago, 14 February 2001, Mr. Speaker. That is the agreement, Mr. Speaker, that established the Caribbean Court of Justice, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. So what we're doing today, Mr. Speaker, what we're doing today, Mr. Speaker, is since St. Lucia already is involved in the Caribbean Court of Justice as far as matters that do not relate to criminality, etc., matters according to the revised treaty of Chagaramas, Mr. Speaker, we are taking the next logical step, Mr. Speaker. The next logical step, which is making the Caribbean Court of Justice, the final appellant court for all matters that relate to St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the CCJ will make justice accessible to the people of St. Lucia. For the last 16 years, Mr. Speaker, there, has only, there have only been 17 cases that have gone to the Privy Council. For the last 16 years, only 17 cases from St. Lucia has gone to the Privy Council. An average of one case per year. And you're talking about justice being accessible? You know why, Mr. Speaker? Because the ordinary St. Lucian
cannot afford to go to the Privy Council, Mr. Speaker. It's inconvenient, Mr. Speaker, and it's costly. And the Caribbean Court of Justice, Mr. Speaker, what it has made justice more accessible to the regular and the ordinary person in the country, including criminals, including people who have been charged or been convicted for criminal offenses. It makes justice, justice accessible to them so they can get a free and fair trial at all levels, Mr. Speaker, of this, at all levels, Mr. Speaker, of the justice system, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I think today the choice that we are making, Mr. Speaker, is whether we think that we are capable of making quality independent judicial decisions, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, whether we have the intellectual and moral capability to produce worthy judges in a country that has produced two Nobel laureates, Mr. Speaker. Whether we can produce legal luminaries at the level of the national courts and the OECS Court of Appeal, but not at the highest level, Mr. Speaker. I refuse to accept that, Mr. Speaker. I refuse to accept that, that we cannot have a group of men and women seven men and women who after this rigorous procedure cannot deliver justice fairly, Mr. Speaker, to the people of St. Lucia. And talking about the judges, Mr. Speaker, you must note that the judges do not have to come from the region. They can come from anywhere in the world. Right now, there's somebody from the Netherlands who is a member of the Caribbean Court of Justice, Mr. Speaker. So we can take, we can get talent once the talent meets the requirements of the agreement, Mr. Speaker. And the, the, the agreement says, in making appointments to the office of the judge, regard shall be had to the following criteria. High moral character, intellectual and analytical ability, sound judgment, integrity, and understanding of people and society. Understanding of people and society. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> Sir Alan Lewis was a federal Supreme Court judge during the West Indies Federation. Sir Daniel Alexander could have been the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Mr. Speaker. Was the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Sir, Sir Daniel these are solutions, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there are other significant members of the judiciary who have become judges. Sir Dennis Byron, Sir Vincent Flosa, men of impeccable legal ability who have done the job in that case one of them being the president of the Caribbean Court of Justice, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I think it is a shame that as a people, we should, we should be so afraid of ourselves as a people. We should have so much, such a lack of confidence in our ability as a nation to be skeptical or even to oppose the Caribbean Court of Justice has been the final court of appeal, Mr. Speaker. When all the limitations, when all effort has been taken to ensure that the court is independent, that the court is free of political influences, and that the judges in the court are men of high judicial knowledge and experience, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on 14 of February, when Prime Minister Kenny Antin of St. Lucia signed the agreement establishing the CCG, St. Lucia subsequently ratified this agreement. St. Lucia as a contracting party agreed that decisions of the Court of Appeal will lie to the CCG. CCG. A session to the appellant jurisdiction of CCJ 
will ensure that St. Lucia falls into full compliance with its solemn international obligation, completing the groundwork carefully laid by Dr. Anthony. St. Lucia has contributed its fair share to the CCJ Trust Fund, whose purpose is to provide the resources necessary to finance the capital and operating budget of the courts and the commission for a long time. St. Lucia has therefore paid millions of dollars for an asset which it is not making use of, Mr. Speaker. The jurisprudence of the CCJ is regarded regionally and internationally with the utmost respect. Decisions of the CCJ are cited with approval in other courts, regionally and internationally, <coughs> including, including the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. The legal profession in Ghana, Barbados, Belize, and Dominica are fully satisfied with the juris jurisprudence and services offered by the CC CCJ. Mr. Speaker, the argument is used sometimes, self-serving argument, that only four countries are members of the CCJ, as far as a final appellant court, Mr. Speaker. But well, Mr. Speaker, the argument is flawed, because the constitutions of this country, these countries, are basically different. And St. Lucia tested, tested it when we sought an opinion from the court as to whether St. Lucia needs a referendum to go into the CCJ. Mr. Speaker, a referendum to go to the CCJ will most likely not yield the results of our, what it is there for, which is to go into the CCJ. Because politicians will intervene, politicians will interfere, politicians will cloud the, will cloud the judgment, and we may get a situation where it does not truly reflect the pros and cons, Mr. Speaker, of going to the CCJ, Mr. Speaker. And there is no legal basis for a referendum, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is more expensive, very expensive, to pursue an appeal to the, CC, to the Privy Council, Mr. Speaker, than it is to appeal to the Caribbean Court of Justice. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, pursuing an appeal to the Privy Council is cost prohibitive. That is why there's only been an average of one appeal per year for the last, for the last 16 years, Mr. Speaker. Ascension to the CCJ makes it possible for more people to appeal to the highest court, Mr. Speaker. The CCJ's case filing and case management is second to none. Long before the pandemic, the CCJ modeled electronic filing and electronic case management well ahead of other courts in the region, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, unlike the OECS state of Grenada, Antigua, and Barbados, I've said so before, St. Lucia does not need a referendum to accede to the CCJ. And this has been confirmed, I said several times before, by the Eastern Caribbean Court of Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, nor it is ideal that the step be taken by proper, popular referendum, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, none of the momentous steps in St. Lucia's history was referred to a referendum. Mr. Speaker, there was no referendum to impose slavery on us. We never went to a referendum to say whether we should be slaves or to have universal added suffrage, Mr. Speaker, or to join the West Indies Federation or to become an associated state, or to become independent. Mr. Speaker, we as a government, having met all the requirements, having stated to the people that that is our intention, having formed a committee of, of ascension to the CGJ, and that committee will continue its work, Mr. Speaker. We have, and having the necessary majority in the parliament, we have a legal, we have a constitutional, and we have a moral right to take St. Lucia into the Caribbean Court of Justice, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish to say, Mr. Speaker, that going to the CCJ is the right thing to do, Mr. Speaker. Justice cannot be the purview of a few, Mr. Speaker. All St. Lucians, all citizens have a right to justice at the highest level, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, in closing, Mr. Speaker, I really wish to say that it's a shame, Mr. Speaker, that in 2023, 
we can have people who still believe that colonialism had a conscience. Who still believe, Mr. Speaker, that the people of this region cannot determine their own destiny. That we cannot find a group, nine, seven or nine men and women of high intellectual and judicial value and respect who cannot take decisions after the system from the magistrate's court to the high court to the supreme court they cannot take decisions based on what happened down there mr speaker it's a shame mr speaker and i'm very happy that the young people of St. Lucia are listening are listening to those who do not want to give them a chance who do not want to allow them to reach the highest levels of intellectual of scientific of political levels in this country who believe that they are not capable who believe that we have to only go to our colonial masters who believe that what exists outside in canada is better than what exists in St. lucia who are ashamed to say that they are products of St. lucia but instead they are products of canada mr speaker i'm happy that the young people of St. lucia are listening mr speaker and this giant step and as I said before, this giant step started by Kenny Anthony and continuing with us, Mr. Speaker. That is how we are. We are, we are a river, we flow, we are a stream, Mr. Speaker. It starts one end and it ends somewhere else, Mr. Speaker. And today, this government, this Labour Party government, is enforcing and showing its confidence after following all the constitutional and consultative requirements. We are proud to see that we're going to ask this house to finally remove us from the shackles of colonialism and thank them for the time but we can say to them we thank you but our time has come to go we love you but we can't stay with you any longer thank you mr speaker